on Wheel of Fortune. Creating a proton to the wheel every night. Who will be the lucky winner of the proton as you test your own skills against the champs? Oh, I'd be able to solve this if I was at home. See, it's a lot easier at home. Wheel of Fortune, 5.30 Monday on 7. Good morning. As the Queen prepares to address the grieving British nation this evening, final preparations for the funeral of Princess Diana are being made today, Friday, September the 5th, 1997. From NBC News, this is Today, with Katie Couric from Westminster Abbey in London, and Matt Lauer from Studio 1A in New York. As you look at a live picture of Westminster Abbey, we can tell you that Queen Elizabeth is on her way to London. These pictures taken just a little while ago when she left Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Bowing to incredible public pressure, the Queen is expected to mingle with these mourners in a little while after signing a book of condolence for Diana at St. James's Palace. And good morning and welcome to today on this Friday morning. We are joining you from Westminster Abbey, the site of Princess Diana's funeral which is scheduled, of course, for tomorrow. 2,500 invited guests will be inside the church. In the meantime, people have already begun to stake out positions along the processional route, trying to get a glimpse of the coffin as it comes by on, during the procession. Officials are now saying that 2.5 billion people may actually watch the funeral on television. That would be an all-time record, breaking the current mark of 700 million who watched Princess uh, Diana marry Prince Charles back in 1981. We are a split show this morning with Matt Lauer joining us from New York. Matt, good morning to you. Katie, good morning to you. What an amazing 24-hour period we're about to experience. Of course, the Queen coming back to London, as you mentioned, and then the speech this evening. Many people are hoping that she'll be somewhat emotional during that. And of course, when you talk about emotion, the funeral tomorrow morning for Princess Diana, Katie. It's bound to be extremely, extraordinarily emotional, Matt. We're going to try to preview all of that from here this morning. And we're also going to see a public criticism of the monarchy, which reached an incredible crescendo yesterday, has subsided here at all. But first, we're going to get the latest news from London. And for that, we turn to NBC's Martin Fletcher, who joins us now from Buckingham Palace. Martin, good morning to you. Katie, good morning. The people spoke. Actually, it was more like a roar, and the Queen listened today. She left Scotland for London a day early. And later today, she'll make what will be only her second ever special television broadcast to the nation. This is real people power, mass mourning for a beloved princess. Their message to the monarchy, no more grieving in seclusion, no more stiff upper lip, lead us in our grief. Bowing to the people, yesterday the royal family finally emerged at Balmoral. At last what the public wanted, moving moments of their queen and her family. And at St. James Palace in London, Prince Charles's brother signed the book of condolence and then mingled with the crowd. And the Queen, pushed by Prince Charles, finally agreed to break tradition. Tomorrow, the flag will fly at half-staff at Buckingham Palace for the first time in Britain's history. But for many here, it's too little, too late. They've been made to do a, a complete U-turn. What are they going to do for Diana? after all this is gone. No, it's not enough. There's so much public feeling toward, uh, of negative, negativeness towards the royal family at the moment. The monarchy will fall. Later today, after Princes William and Harry have spent their first private moments with their late mother, Diana's coffin will be moved from St. James's Palace to her residence, Kensington Palace, about two miles away. From there, the funeral procession will begin tomorrow. It is expected to be the biggest public gathering in British history. Police estimates range from one to six million people crammed into central London. Almost every policeman in London will be on duty, as well as VIP protection units of the special forces. There is uh, an enormous crowd control and security problem. That perhaps is the greatest problem, quite apart from any possible terrorist threat. The coffin, born on a horse-drawn gun carriage and accompanied by 12 soldiers of the Welsh Guards, will travel three and a half miles. It still isn't clear if Diana's children will walk with the coffin from Kensington Palace, through the Mall and past Horse Guards Parade to Westminster Abbey, where the funeral service will be held. And it seems to me you lived your life. Again, bowing to pressure, the royal family agreed that Diana's friend, Elton John, will sing at the funeral, Candle in the Wind. 
a nod to Diana's more modern lifestyle that led her into such conflict with the monarchy. Princess Diana's family announced today they changed her final resting place. They're afraid the public village cemetery would become another Graceland, so they decided to bury her on private land inside the family's ancestral home. Katie? Martin Fletcher. Martin, thanks so much. And two programming notes for you now. NBC News will carry the Queen's Address to the Nation live. That's at 1 p.m. Eastern today, 10 Pacific. And tomorrow morning, we will have live coverage of the funeral service from here at Westminster Abbey, beginning at 2.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Meanwhile, in Paris, police continue to focus their attention on the photographers and what role they may have played in the death of Princess Diana, her companion Dodi Fayed, and the driver of the car. NBC's Richard Roth is in Paris now with more on what one of those photographers is saying. Richard, good morning. Good morning, Katie. Well, French police are now looking into the account of a man from Normandy who was in Paris last weekend and says he saw a motorcyclist swerve in front of the Mercedes in the tunnel just before it crashed. That could be important, of course, in the investigation of the photographers. And this morning, we have the story of one of them, Nikola Arsov, who says he, too, has been scarred by the events of this week. She was beautiful. She was gorgeous. It's an image that will stay with me for the rest of my life because, after all, it was Princess Diana. C could you see, was she, was she breathing? Was she moving? I noticed there was a moment when I saw this. She had that, but it was very fast. In my opinion, I think she was still breathing. 38-year-old Nikola Arsov makes his living taking pictures. Just last month, he was covering British Prime Minister Tony Blair's French vacation. Last weekend, he'd been assigned to cover Princess Diana. And at the crash site, he was one of the photographers arrested. Did, did anyone say, I got a picture, I made a picture that I really want? On n'a pas parlé de ça. We didn't talk about that. We didn't talk about that, not at all. I think we were mocked by it because we were there, because of what we lived through, what we saw. Seeing the death that you saw or having the experience of being arrested as you were? Diana, the sight of Diana. That's what stays with me. In the tunnel where they died, someone has now painted on the wall paparazzi assassins. Assassins is not true. We didn't kill anyone. We killed no one. One interesting note this morning, photographers here say the British Press Association has asked that no French photographers be sent to cover the funeral and photo agencies here are expected to honor the request. Katie? Richard Roth in Paris. Richard, thank you very much. Needless to say, we'll have much more on the funeral of Princess Diana in a few moments, but now we want to go back to New York for the rest of the morning's news and Matt. All right, Katie, thank you very much. We, of course, are following another major story this morning. It's been another deadly day in the Middle East. One day after Thursday's bombings in Jerusalem, there's been new violence this morning in South Lebanon where at least 11 Israeli soldiers have been killed. NBC's Tom Aspel has more now from Tel Aviv. Tom, good morning to you. Matt, this morning, Israelis stunned by a suicide bombing in Jerusalem were hit with more bad news. The deaths of more Israeli soldiers overnight in Lebanon. This is the biggest Israeli battle loss in South Lebanon for more than 10 years. Israeli commanders were on an overnight mission south of the Lebanese port city of Sidon when they ran into an ambush triggered by Lebanese army troops fighting alongside Muslim guerrillas. Eleven Israeli commanders were killed, four were wounded, and one Israeli is still missing. Israel still reeling from civilian casualties caused by triple suicide bombers in central Jerusalem Thursday. Where is this peace process going? Only the United States of America can persuade the Palestinian Authority to change its ways and to fight terrorism, to crack down on the terrorist infrastructure. To fight terror bombings, the Israeli government has once again sealed off Palestinian areas in Gaza and the West Bank and rounded up 69 suspects. Many Israelis now blame Arafat personally. The 
chairman of the organization which is supposed to make peace with Israel is a terrorist, period. There is certain to be an Israeli response to the suicide bombings and to the military disaster in South Lebanon. But for now, the country is in mourning. They could well be in mourning for the death of the peace process itself. There are no more contacts between Israelis and Palestinians. Both sides are waiting for American diplomatic intervention. Matt? All right, Tom Aspel in Israel this morning. Tom, thank you. And Ann Curry will have more news in our next half hour. But right now at 7.10, we turn our attention to Mr. Al Roker. Al, what's up? Okay, Matt. Well, of course, uh, all eyes will be on the British Isles for tomorrow. And uh, we're looking at sunshine temperatures in the upper 60s tomorrow for the funeral of Princess Diana. Tr closer to home, tropical storm Erica, about six, uh, 250 miles east-southeast of Antigua, 65-mile-per-hour winds moving west-northwest at uh, 17 miles per hour. There are tropical storm warnings up for good portions of the Caribbean. That's what's going on around the country. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. now back to Westminster Abbey and Katie. Thank you, Al. On close-up this morning, a funeral for a princess. Andrew Roberts is a royal historian. Andrew, nice to see you again. Good Hello. morning. I know that you've been mingling with the crowd for the last hour or so. Tell me what the mood is down there, what people are saying, how they're behaving. Well, some of these people have been camping out here since Thursday, and uh, they're very um, excited by the whole thing starting. They're very worried, um, I got lots of people say they're very worried that Elton John won't be able to sing his song because he'll be too distressed uh, singing, uh, sorry, too distressed to sing, like he was at uh, Gianni Versace's funeral. But other than that, um, just a great outpouring of emotion as usual. And I, I understand that people are being extremely polite and courteous to one another, sharing their sandwiches, helping each other, which yes, is really nice. Yes, and some nice. of the cameramen have given, um, have given sheets for people to sleep on, which um, you don't really get from, uh, from your average cameraman. In the meantime, I understand that you have heard that, that the Queen and Prince Charles, for that matter, are quite angry at the reaction to their reaction. Privately, I think um, it's true, I know it's true to say that they're furious, that the British uh, media, if not the people, um, have suspected that they're not sad about this. They're sad not least because of Diana, but certainly because of the children. And. Uh, and that's why the Queen will be going on television later on, although, of course, she can't be expected to express her anger publicly. The uh, only glimpse the public has seen of the coffin is when it was returned to London after the accident. So let's talk about the funeral procession, if we could. Who will be following the casket? Well, there'll be 500 people following the casket, five people each from 100 of the charitable organizations that the princess was connected with. I think the youngest person is about five years old. It'd be quite a, quite a walk three miles for a five-year-old. And what about Prince William and Prince Harry? Is it still unclear? Th that is going to be decided by the two princes on their own tonight, whether or not uh, it'll be just Prince William on his own or the two together or Harry behind William or neither of them is going to be made up. They're going to make up their minds this evening. What about the rest of the royal family? Well, they will be coming by, um, by car, as, as would be uh, expected. The, the coffin will be on a horse-drawn gun carriage. Yes. And that's created a bit of controversy. Some people say it's too militaristic for Diana. Well, um, that's ridiculous. Diana went to visit her regiments that she was a colonel and chief of. She always took her military duties very seriously, and it's an ancient tradition to carry great, great uh, coffins on gun During carriages. the procession, it will be complete silence, save for one tenor bell ringing every minute from Westminster Abbey. The, the stillness will be quite moving and overwhelming, won't it? That's what, um, that's the atmosphere that it's intended to create. That's what happens at uh, great funerals in this country. And it will be um, gut-wrenchingly moving, I'm sure. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the landmarks that will, the coffin will be passing on the route. Well, it will be leaving Kensington Palace, where she uh, lived, going down a long route towards Hyde Park Corner, where there's the Wellington Arch. It will be going through the Wellington Arch, which is very unusual indeed that the gates of Wellington Arch are ever opened. The Wellington Arch was uh, set up, one of our greatest military heroes. Then it's going to be coming on past uh, the Constitution Hill, past Buckingham Palace, 
and moving up towards Whitehall, which is where all the uh, government offices are, where number 10 Downing Street is. Then it's going to come here to uh, Parliament Square. It's going to go past Big Ben, past the Houses of Parliament, and come up the street behind you to the Abbey. We only have a bit of time left, but I was surprised to hear that Queen Elizabeth would not be going to the burial. Well, she's coming to the funeral, which is in itself extremely unusual. She doesn't usually go to funerals uh, for anybody. And uh, so she's going to have had quite a harrowing and long period uh, of mourning already. I don't think it can be expected that she should necessarily see it right the way through to the end, like the rest of the family will be. All right. Andrew Roberts, Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you. Westminster Abbey has played a large role in the rich history of this country. NBC's Keith Miller has more on this place where the world's attention will be focused tomorrow. It is not just a place of worship. Westminster Abbey is the National Church of Great Britain. Kings and queens have been crowned here. The great and the good have passed through these doors. It is where the British people as a nation come before God in celebration and in mourning. Princess Diana's funeral will be both. The service will be held in the Abbey where her former husband, Prince Charles, could one day be crowned king. Going to get a clash between the mystery of monarchy, something which is above the law and above men and slightly below God and the angels, and what Britain has always passed on to the world as democracy. And it's going to be a very, very potent cocktail indeed. Construction of the Abbey started in the 13th century. Originally, it was run by the Benedictines. It soon became a place of ceremony that bestowed dignity upon the nation. Kings and queens have been crowned here since the time of William the Conqueror in 1066. The last coronation here saw Elizabeth II being crowned queen in 1953. The Abbey is also a place where the great and not so good were married. The queen's wedding took place here with all the pomp and circumstance that surrounds a royal ceremony. The Duke of York and Sarah Ferguson said, I do, before the great altar. Diana's own parents were married here, too. Walk us through Westminster Abbey. Give us an idea what the viewers at home will see during the funeral service. The first sight will be very, very grand. A soaring nave, a nave where kings and queens have, have met, have married, and have been uh, carried to their graves. The last time the nation's focus turned to Westminster Abbey for a funeral was in 1965 when the nation mourned the passing of Winston Churchill. I think it's very interesting that they have brought Diana into Westminster Abbey. That is quite outstanding. And in death, the nation will pay tribute to Princess Diana in a place that in so many ways defines what it is to be British and what it means to be loved. For today, Keith Miller, NBC News, Westminster Abbey. And the New Yorker magazine has a special edition out today dedicated to Princess Diana. In it, editor Tina Brown writes that the once shy princess had become a woman who spoke her mind. Tina, nice to see you. I know that you wrote your first article for the New Yorker. You called it A Woman in Earnest. It was based on a luncheon you had with Princess Diana along with Anna Wintour, yes. I guess during the period when she was auctioning off her gown. That's right, yes. How did you find her? I found her very self-possessed very much uh, a woman who had emerged from a difficult period and now seemed to have put herself back together. She was surprisingly forthcoming, wasn't she? Yeah, she was very forthcoming. She surprised me enormously how willing she was really to talk about the royal family and her problems with them. You were, uh, I guess, criticized in some quarters back in 1985 mm -hmm. when you wrote an article for Vanity Fair called The Mouse That Roared. It was considered unflattering. Yes. in some circles. That was 12 years ago. Yes. How have you seen her evolve? What I've seen really is how she went first from the shy, you know, country mouse to being a panic-stricken and imprisoned and emotionally chaotic uh, woman who, uh, whose pressures nearly killed her, but who then put herself back together in the most admirable way and decided to make her suffering into something positive. And I think it was the, it was the uh, effort to do that that turned her into somebody else, and somebody who I think one should very much admire. When you had lunch with her this summer, she had some interesting things to say about Prince Charles, didn't she? 
Yes, I mean, she felt uh, really that Prince Charles wasn't cut out to be the king, that she, he would have really been very much happier living in a house in Tuscany and having artists to stay and people of a quieter disposition. She felt that he was not a leader, that he was a follower. And yet she spoke of him, I understand, with some fondness. Yes, despite those feelings, one did feel that she had, again, emerged from her rancor about it with the, with the divorce and had actually was, was finding her way back to uh, an accommodation with him that was much more attractive. She said some very kind things, obviously. She was felt so proud of her sons, William and Harry, and she had a very interesting role model for William when it came to the media, correct? Yes, yeah, she, she said, interestingly, that she hoped very much that William would show the same kind of uh, professional and uh, well-adjusted handling of the media that she felt that John F. Kennedy Jr. had shown. And she really admired the way Jackie Onassis had been able to instill that in her son so that he could cope with the world that he was going to face. I thought it was interesting that she told you that she had tried and tried to help the palace improve its image, even urging the royals to hire some kind of PR maven. Did that strike you yes. as, as funny? Uh, it struck me as, uh, as sensible, actually. I mean, I think that her feeling was that they needed more help than they were getting, even though they did every so often call in PR helpers. I think she felt that they needed a better quality of advisor. You also asked her if she found it draining to spend so much time with dying people with her work in hospices. Um, and she basically said on the contrary, didn't she? Yes, yeah, she said interestingly that being in the presence of dying people gave her strength. That she, uh, the, the, the act of giving joy to her was energizing and that she never really tired of the ability to do that. Do you think from these people she helped, Tina, that she was able to, to find the love that seemed to elude her for, for so long, during so much of her life? Yes, I do. I strongly feel that, that she realized that she was never going to find personal happiness and love in her own, you know, in her own home. And that that really gave her uh, the ability to, to, to put that love elsewhere. And, and, and of course, what happened was that she received it back with manifold ways. All right, Tina Brown, thanks so much. A special yeah. reminder that the special edition of The New Yorker is available on newsstands today. And Tina will be back with us tomorrow morning as part of our live NBC coverage of the funeral of Princess Diana. It is 721. We'll be back in a moment. But first, with a special edition of today from Westminster Abbey, this is today on NBC. Tuesday. I'll let you do a little secret. Bringing the outdoors indoors. He's about official. Create your very own Mediterranean masterpiece and join John Hello. as the house really starts to take shape. Better Homes and Gardens, 7.30 Tuesday. Then at 8 o'clock, become a fighter pilot for a day. Hit the track in a real outback adventure and saddle yourself up. Anne-Marie discovers the picture-perfect Wild West on the great outdoors after Better Homes and Gardens, Tuesday on 7. There's only seconds left and the scores are tied. Australia has possession. Liz Ellis wants to get the ball away as quickly as possible. But there's been a fumble. Recovered, interception, one back, lost. Carissa Toombs has the ball. As major sponsors of Netball Australia, Fisher and Paykel is interested in the next test and the next batch of champions. It's in. Vicky Wilson has done it for Australia and the bench is going wild. It's a lovely day. Every girl is a cover girl, cover girls, big girls, little girls, short girls, tall girls, young girls, and, well, all our girls are cover girls. For the guy who thought he had it all, get a little bit more. Call a cover girl tonight. 190-22-10078. Cover girls are here. 190-22-10078. Songs from the South is Paul Kelly's greatest hits. Twenty classic tracks from Australia's best songwriter. Tales of ordinary life from an extraordinary storyteller. Songs from the South, Paul Kelly's greatest hits, out now. 726, we're back in New York. Mac, Al, and Anne. The funeral begins 2.45 Eastern time this morning. 
I believe that's correct. No, I think it's not. I think the funeral actually begins at 6 o'clock Eastern time. The, the coverage begins. Our, our coverage, coverage begins at 2.30. Okay. I'll be coverage beginning it, at 2.45. And the procession begins at around 4-ish. What do you think will be the most dramatic moment? When the, when the casket emerges from St. James's Palace for the first time on the gun carriage? You know, I, I think the sight of her sons yeah. will mm -hmm. be the most emotional moment for me. Yeah. yeah. Whether they walk behind the casket or not. You know, the, this, I mean, this morning, I'm just really, I mean, after watching yesterday's pictures of them looking at the flowers outside Balmoral Castle, I was just really thinking how, how hard this must be for them. My heart really is with them. Yeah, and that's funny, the interesting most. thing is that Tina Brown just said that, you know, Diana had always wanted um, William. Good morning. Ross Simons breaking into our regular programming to introduce a special Olympic presentation. Through CNN from Lausanne in Switzerland, we're about to join the official ceremony to name the city which will host the Olympic Games in 2004. Five cities want to host the Games, Rome, Athens, Cape Town, Buenos Aires and Stockholm. Now it's over to Lausanne. These are the cities that hope the 2004 Olympic decision goes their way. The Greek capital Athens, birthplace of the ancient and modern Olympics. Rome, the Italian capital and host city for the 1960 Summer Games. Stockholm in Sweden, which invites the world to visit the city and feel the light. Buenos Aires in Argentina, making its fifth bid to stage the Games. And Cape Town in South Africa, hoping the Olympics will be staged in Africa for the first time. Hello and welcome to this CNN special, An Olympic Decision. I'm Phil Jones. The five delegations are in Lausanne, Switzerland, awaiting the announcement from Juan Antonio Samarange, the International Olympic Committee president. The announcement is expected less than half an hour from now. This is a scene there at the moment. Each city is given a 45-minute presentation. Now they wait for news of the vote. South African President Nelson Mandela is there. He's been making a final plea on behalf of Cape Town to the 107 voting IOC members to send the Games to Africa for the first time. But staging the Summer Games would be nothing new to three European candidates. Rome, Athens and Stockholm have all held the Olympics before. We take a look now at their respective bids to bring the Games back. Starting with CNN's Gail Young in the city made odds on favourite by the bookmakers to win the race for 2004. The ring of church bells and the roar of bulldozers can be heard across Rome as the Holy City prepares public transport and facilities for the year 2000. The Vatican has declared it a jubilee year, and Italy expects 40 million visitors to flock to Rome for the anniversary of the birth of Christ. Olympic organizers say the new infrastructure and increased hotel capacity makes Rome an ideal candidate for the 2004 Olympics, as does the city's breathtaking beauty and historic legacy. The famed Colosseum has become the symbol of the Olympic movement. Olympic Games can give to the city something more, but also the city can give something more human to the Olympic Games. Rome has already hosted the Olympic Games once, back in 1960, but organizers concede that the city will need to build dozens of new stadiums and sports venues if it's chosen again. Compared to 1960, the 2004 Olympics will be a whole new ball game. Then, Rome only had to accommodate about 4,000 athletes and officials. Now, that figure's more like 50,000. Opponents worry that the Olympic crowd will damage fragile Roman landmarks. That the city's traffic, almost as legendary as its monuments, will become unbearable. And that corruption, Italian style, will detract from any financial benefit. I don't think that the contemporary Olympic Games are uh, compatible with uh, uh, a good quality of life in any town, certainly not in Rome. Still, Rome is lobbying heavily for the game. Rome. The state has already pledged about two billion dollars for the construction of new sports facilities. Hosting the Olympics has become a monumental undertaking. And monumental is a concept that Romans believe they are familiar with. Gail Young, CNN, Rome. 
Seven years ago, many Athenians believed themselves players in a Greek tragedy. The centennial Olympic Games were awarded to a city other than the Greek capital, the home of the first modern Olympiad. Atlanta, the hometown of Coca-Cola, was chosen over Athens, the city of Pericles and Plato. Terra was chosen over the Parthenon. It is true to say that uh, Athenians at that time uh, were not happy at all. But um, I think uh, that right now we are better prepared, practically, psychologically, morally. Indeed, Athens is in the race for the 2004 Games with a vengeance. This time, organizers say they're determined to convince the IOC that Athens is a suitable Olympic host, not just a sentimental favorite. We want to win on merit and not by right. We were so loyal to the Games and we are so loyal to Olympic ideals that we improved our candidacy. We corrected our mistakes and now we bid again and we believe we have a strong bid with very strong elements. What are these elements? A public support rating of 96% and major infrastructure works. Buildings are being spruced up, roads are being cleaned up and projects are breaking ground, all in line with the ancient city's Olympian facelift. Organizers say that the new airport under construction will bring in record crowds to the Games. 70 kilometers of new highways will facilitate the fans' transport to stadiums scattered across Athens. And a modern metro will push thousands of smoky vehicles off the roads to reduce stifling air pollution. Athens, in some years from today, will be one of the most beautiful, most functional and cleanest cities in the world. Dubbed as the biggest construction dig in Europe, the works are due to be finished by the year 2000. That's when the remaining 25% of the athletic facilities are slated for completion. But Greeks are neither known for their punctuality or concern for the environment. Critics say the capital is simply too polluted and too populated to play Olympic host, and that two bird habitats may be destroyed by plans to build canoeing and baseball sites. A year after terrorism marred the Atlanta Games, however, security concerns dominate the Greek bid. The country is home to Europe's most elusive terrorist group, November 17. IOC members, athletes and fans, however, got a taste of the draconian measures in store when Athens hosted the World Track and Field Championships in August. So what will happen if Athens doesn't get the 2004 Games? With 96% of the people backing the bid, It'll be the Greek tragedy, Act Two. Antika Rasava for CNN, Athens. Stockholm has been using its Feel the Light campaign to paint a glowing picture of the things the city has to offer for the 2004 Games. Take organization. Stockholm says nearly three quarters of all Olympic events will take place within a five kilometer radius of the Olympic ring take transportation. Stockholm boasts a modern public transportation system it claims already has three times the capacity of last year's host city, Atlanta. There's the environment. City leaders say Stockholm has the cleanest air and water of any major European capital. And there's light itself. The northern capital enjoys 19 hours of sunlight in July an important consideration when it comes to athletes and coverage. But there are hurdles that must still be cleared. Stockholm was embarrassed by this week's allegations since withdrawn that it offered gifts to IOC members. More serious, however, is the issue of safety. In recent months, Swedish cities have been hit by arson attacks and bombings. But even these are being cast in the best possible light by Stockholm organizers. This, the police made also a very firm statement again that there is no connection or evidence whatsoever about the bomb, between the bomb and the Stockholm 2004 game. And that's important. In fact, Stockholm backers are playing both sides of the safety issue. They imply that if the attacks are directed against the 2004 games, it's all the more reason to award the event to Sweden. It's a way, they say, of choosing peace over violence. Ulrika Nilsson, CNN reporting. So there you have the European contenders. When we come back, we'll hear from the other two candidates. 
The Olympics have never been staged in South America. Buenos Aires aims to use a corridor of power to change that. And Cape Town is bidding for an Olympic first for Africa to bring the black ring of the Olympic flag into play. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Stuart Diver. We all lost lots of friends in the Threadbow tragedy. To help the people of Threadbow, the families and the rescuers, please give to the special Threadbow Fund. You can be sure all your donations will help the victims of this tragedy and those who give their all when disasters happen. Now's the chance for all of us to give back to those who've given so much. The Threadbow Family Relief Fund, proudly supported by the Australian Women's Weekly and Seven. Now there's a line where you can talk to both men and women. Call anytime, day or night. It's easy. Talk to me. Or talk to me at the chat club. Who knows where it can go? So give the chat club a call on 1900 146 500. Talk to me. Or talk to me. Speak live online with up to 60 guys and girls. There's no pressure and no hassle. Just talk. Call the chat club anytime, day or night. Begin a new and exciting relationship on the chat club. Call 1900 146 500. 